Hi everyone, welcome to my session. Before we begin, let's give a quick thanks to our sponsors. Without them, events like this just can't happen. Script Runner, DQ Global, Proximo 3, Redspire, Agilisys, and Hitachi Solutions. Okay, final bit of thanks before we get into the meat of the session. I really am standing on the shoulder of giants, much like this uh, Oasis album. I've been mentored for this session by the absolutely awesome Megan V. Walker. I originally got into portals through consuming her excellent content. She's been kind enough to guide me through this process, help me get my blog up to scratch, help me get my content delivery much better than what it was. And then also massive thanks to everyone I learned portals from, all the people that share valuable content week in and week out, Nick Dolman, Nicholas Hayduck, Jim Novak. You've no doubt come across those and if you've been Googling trying to find any help on portals, their content second to none. And finally, big thanks also to Paddy Byrne, Reese Campbell, David Small, Ryan McLean for giving up their time for the practice sessions. Hopefully this session is all the better as a result of your invaluable feedback. Welcome everyone, and thanks for joining my session. I'm Frank Musso. I'm a functional consultant and citizen developer, and I love everything Power Platform. I started with Dynamics 365, or Dynamics CRM back in the day, but for the last few years, I've specialised in portals. This project brings together my passion for music, design, portals and teaching. I was trying to teach my daughter to do some Saturday work with me. The idea was to teach her model-driven apps first, get an understanding of data models, views, forms, all that good stuff, and I just wasn't getting any traction. Wasn't making any connection, and the first thing she did every time she was distracted was play around with her phone. So I thought, perhaps to make this more attention grabbing, I should relate the concepts to the apps she uses every day. So we started with the mail app and got across the idea that in this case, there's an email message record, various different views and statuses that drive the whole thing, and some actions which might be likened to workflow. And that seemed to land a little bit better. But again, we hit that point where she was distracted. Her go-to app is Spotify. So I figured, let's model Spotify. So it began as a model-driven app. We built things like tracks, albums, artists, saw how we'd relate those things together, and then we built the like functionality. As I said, with the day job, I focus on portals and figured let's make this a portal project. It'll let us break the mold. It'll let us push things further than I can with my day job. I don't really get the chance to go beyond MVP as far as styling is concerned. So I thought the Spotify clone could be the place to do this. I'll give you a demo of the portal in just a moment, but essentially that's how the project came about. It's always been about learning. Started with teaching my daughter model-driven apps, and since then, I've also learned a lot of things along the way. And now I'm gonna share that learning with you. So here's what I plan to cover in today's talk. This is the structure for the next 40 minutes. First, I'll demo the portal. You'll see Songify in all its glory to see the art of the portable. We'll then go into the model-driven app behind the scenes to see the data structure and how things hang together. Then we'll finish up with the six liquid snippets to rule them all. Then we'll cover how to get that liquid onto a page in the portal. Let's get started. The first thing we see is the home page, and this is how it looks for anonymous users, so anybody pre-logging. They get a sample of some of the songs. These aren't authenticated. These are from web files at the moment. So these will be publicly available to everybody. So just a bit of a sales page, really. Selling the benefits of why you would join Songify. And then when I sign in, the sign in is via ADB to C. I'm first going to sign in as a subscriber to see how the experience looks to the end customer. And then the page that we see on signing is in fact the exact same page as what we saw before, but we've got a condition on there to show one particular piece of content prior to login and a separate piece of content after login. So at a glance, I can see any saved playlists, albums, artists, all in one page. And then if we briefly take a look at the rest of the pages available to us, I've got my liked songs. So here are the songs that I've liked recently and the background image is set to the artwork for one of these particular artists for the tracks that I've liked. And what I can do from here, if I choose that perhaps one of these songs I've just listened to too much recently, 
and I want to remove from my light songs, I can simply hit the heart icon and that'll get rid of that particular track. Deletes a record from the model driven app and as you can see as some visual feedback just hides that from the page. The next screen is a list of playlists. Again, that I've liked, so this is my choice of playlists. And I can go into any of those. So here I have some playlists. I can click through these, view the playlist. And what you can see here, I can like the playlist. I can play the playlist, so I can actually skip through the tracks, play the tracks. <laughs> These aren't the actual tracks that are named, unfortunately I've not got the permission to play these, so this is just some royalty free music for the time being, just to demonstrate the functionality. You may also notice that I've got the artwork blown up in the background. So this is taking this cover art, applying it to the body of this HTML page and blurring it out. So I tried to copy that from um, that effect just for my CSS learning really from the Spotify app on Apple CarPlay. I like the way that it, it rebranded itself essentially to every playlist that I played. Then on to artists. So again, I can drill into any of these records, see more information about that particular artist and view any tracks by them. But for the design and maybe the maths geeks out there, I've got a plugin on this particular page that analyzes a banner image. So here the picture of rudimental and it's extracting the average color of that particular image, which is taken to be a light gray. And that's why the Songify logo is appearing in a different color and this navigation bar is. So it's always going to blend with a particular image for the artist displayed on this template. And I've applied that frosted effect using CSS. It's not part of that image. So we're using one of my favorite properties in CSS, the backdrop filter. So this blurs anything behind that particular element. Let's take a look at the albums page next. Something special about this page, as far as the styling is concerned, is that we've got multiple pieces of artwork. So I've used liquid to take one of those cover images at random and blow that up, use that as the background. So what you'll notice is each time this page refreshes, each time it loads, it'll be a different background image. So currently using this album, Dig Out Your Soul's artwork. If I refresh, it's now using a different one, refresh again. So I'll try not to get distracted by that. I have been stuck in a loop just refreshing and refreshing and just enjoying the novelty of that. So next, let's go into an album very much like the treatment for playlists. So we've got that same idea going on in the background that we've got the artwork blown up. We can like the album if we choose to. Over here on the right, we've got all of the um, tracks for that particular album. If we have artwork uploaded, that'll display in this thumbnail. And we can skip between the tracks, just like we saw with the playlist. And speaking of playlists, let's go ahead and actually create one now. So as a subscriber, I can go ahead, create a new playlist. And this is just an out of the box web form, a multi-step web form that I've styled up just to feel a little bit different. So pop in a name for that. And then now that playlist exists within Dynamics, we can add any number of playlist tracks to that. So just the usual lookup experience that you would imagine.
Okay, and when I submit that, I've got that redirecting. So rather than a dead end, allows Layla in this example to automatically play that newly um, generated playlist. And to make it feel a bit user friendly, you'll see we've got the message across the top of the screen advising Layla that this is her shiny new playlist. Just like we saw before, treatment of the artwork, play the tracks, skip through the tracks. We're almost at the end of this consumer look at the uh, Songify portal. We can also search. So if Layla wanted a tracks or any of those entities, in fact, not just particularly tracks that we can search. And as you can see, we've got the faceted results using the out of the box template. So we can filter to see tracks or just playlists or just artists and then click through to complete that experience. Finally, let's take a look at the profile page. I've customized this to show the user's profile photo and allow them to change it through the portal. Again, using the portal web API. So here's the customized profile page. You'll see that Layla's got a profile photo already and perhaps she thinks it's a bit corny to have a picture of a dad with her, even though it's at a music festival. So let's choose another one. So here's Layla alone. That uploads using the Portal Web API. And when we get into the back end of our model driven app, you'll see that is now the entity image for Layla's contact record. Okay, so let's switch over now and we'll see how this looks as an administrator. So here I am logged in as Songify staff or the experience will be very similar for record label admin. So I arrive at a dashboard much like what we saw as a subscriber. I've got all the same options, but I've got this additional menu bar that I only show to administrators. So the two main things I can do from here is that I can edit tracks in bulk. So this is my version of an editable grid. I can come in here and make changes across my whole music library and save those in one go. So I've copied some functionality from the out of the box forms so I can highlight any fields that have changed with the is dirty class and I've used CSS just to highlight which fields it is that have changed. So what that'll do in just a moment when I click the save changes button is rather than write back every record to Dynamics or require that I click save on every single row, it's going to look out for only rows that have had fields changed. As part of building this template, what I've done is just left some helpers behind the scenes so I can see, for example, what's the GUID of this particular record. So this row in the table, which record does that represent? And that just makes it easier when I write back with the Portal Web API to know which record it is to update. And likewise, for each row in the table, leaving myself helpers. So for example, here's the artist, the GUID for that artist. Okay, so I'll click Save Changes. And what you'll see in just a moment when I click this is the Change Status column here on the right will just provide a bit of visual feedback to let the user know that that record's being processed. And then once that completes, as you'll see, that'll change to show a green tick mark. And then finally, we have the upload new track functionality. The unique challenge for this, is that I specifically need a note called artwork that only allows images and specifically a note called audio that only allows MP3s. So I've used the web API to specifically create those notes with that particular name and to set the description of those notes so that they're visible to the portal. So they'll have a description of asterisk web asterisk. So I'm going to upload a track called Song 2 by Blur. Big one in my uni days. I'll 
copy and paste the description and move on to the next stage. Now we're combining a web form with functions using the Portal Web API. So very similar to what we saw with the entity image, I can choose some artwork Once that's uploaded, I'll see a preview of the thumbnail just to confirm I've got the right um, image. Let's go for the audio. And again, thinking how I could provide the best feedback, the way for a user to check this is a correct track. Once that's actually uploaded, rather than show an image, it'll show an audio player so I can listen back, make sure I've got the right track. It takes a moment or two for that to load up. So I can see now there's a duration and I can confirm that um, there is music and it is the correct track. When I click submit, I'm going to be taken to that track to see how it would look for subscribers. So I click submit. And here's a preview of how that would look for the end users, the subscribers of the portal. And on this particular page, I've experimented with that color thief plugin again to calculate the dominant color in that image and coordinate the rest of the page. So things like the admin bar, the like button, and here in the playlist is meant to match the image. And as you might imagine, I can just hit the play button to have a preview of that particular song. Before we jump into the liquid, let's take a look at the data model and the model driven app that drive the portal. There are three audiences for the Songify portal. There are Songify staff, they do their day to day work in this model driven app. And they also have administrator web roles for the portal, allowing them to edit all the content. There are record label and artist management staff, and they have account level permissions on the portal to manage music and content for the artists on their record label only. And finally, we have subscribers or listeners, and these are set up as contacts. Their permissions allow them to listen to all published music, create their own playlists and manage their profile. So record labels use the account entity, listeners use the contact entity. And the reason for this is that's what drives portal security. So in other situations, I might have created separate custom entities for subscribers and for record labels, because I'm not leveraging any of the out of the box business processes on these entities, nor making use of many of the standard fields. But just remember that the security model for portals is based on accounts and contacts. So be sure to utilize those. Besides our record labels and subscribers, the whole thing revolves around tracks. A track can be either a song or a podcast episode. So I'm going to search for a track. And let's see some of the information um, stored about this. We've got Details directly about the track, such as its duration, whether it was released as a single, whether it's explicit. We have lookup fields, so relating this to at least a main artist, but there's also the option to choose who was featured on that particular track. We have a number of notes as standard for any track, which we'll come back to in just a moment. And there are various many-to-many -many relationships. This allows one particular track to feature on various different albums multiple playlists and to be liked by any number of users. A like is a general purpose record, so it's not limited only to tracks. If I open that up, you'll see that I equally could have created that like against an album, an artist or a playlist. But essentially it's relating a piece of music to a particular customer. A future bit of functionality. Hi Layla. Future bit of functionality is to um, be able to leave a rating as well for that particular track. So back to the notes. All the artwork and the audio tracks for the portal are stored as note attachments regarding a particular track, album, artist or playlist. To help me pinpoint the correct notes when writing my queries for the templates, I've used a particular naming convention. So I know that every single track has got these particular notes, at least audio and artwork. And then we have this auto generated note called artwork 200 pixel thumbnail.
So what's that resized artwork all about? A real bugbear of mine is web pages that load slowly because of images that haven't been optimized for the web and are just needlessly big. No need for a 20 megapixel photo to fill a 200 pixel thumbnail. So I thought I'd take care of that. The aim was to keep the upload experience nice and simple for record label admins, but also keep the performance snappy for subscribers when they come to consume that content. So leveraging Power Automate, I'm using Encodian's API to automatically generate a low res copy of the uploaded artwork. So for example, here's the original artwork. So nice, high quality, high res. And then here's my 200 pixel version, which is much lighter. So when it comes to something like just populating a list of thumbnails in a playlist, that'll load way, way quicker. So let's take a quick look at that flow. Okay, so here we are on the flow. So the trigger is when a note that has a title of artwork gets updated. So specifically looking at the attachment, we want to get a copy of that. So I'm using Encodian's resize an image action to send that particular file in binary format, converting base64, which the note lives in to binary and specifically requesting that that's resized to 200 pixels and that the original aspect ratio is maintained. So I tend to use square images for the portal. This will keep them as square images. And then the next, just providing a bit of flexibility, lets me take care of whether that note is regarding a track, an album, an artist, or a playlist, or a tour, in fact. So let's look at how that runs for a track. So the first thing it does is takes that artwork image and also attaches it as that record's entity image. I've got a field of type image and that's called artwork and I'm setting that to the file content that's come back from Encodian, the resized image. The next thing I do is retrieve that entity image, convert it to base64 for attaching to notes within Dynamics and then attaches that to a note with the name that we just saw on the track. So artwork 200 pixel thumbnail. And I'm setting the actual contents to the output of this compose action. And finally, setting it regarding the track. And the last step there as a bit of a helper is I populate a couple of fields on the track with the GUID of the original artwork note and the GUID of this resized artwork note. And that just makes things easier to query when it comes to liquid in my web templates. So here's an example of how that looks. So I've got easy access to the GUID for that artwork, the resized artwork and the audio note. So hopefully that was helpful and not too much information. Okay, let's get on to liquid. So why create your own web templates? One of my guilty pleasures during lockdown has been interior design challenge. Imagine you're tasked with remodeling your office building for the best possible working experience, but you're restricted to just painting and decorating the existing walls, constrained by the layout. How much more powerful could that transformation be if you had control of where the doors and walls were? If you could remodel, change the ceiling height, if you had total control over the structure and the layout. Well, that's exactly what you gain if you take the leap into creating your own web templates. So the focus in this talk is going to be about making your own templates rather than hacking or extending existing templates. We'll create our web templates using the liquid templating language. 
but don't let the word language put you off. There isn't a ton of code to learn. Liquid lets us achieve a heck of a lot with very little code. My approach might sound very familiar. Google, find a piece of code, copy and paste it, adapt to my needs, and job done. But then I like to spend some more time, pick it apart, and see why it was done that way. How can I reuse that snippet? How can I push it further? What else can this bring to my tool set with a bit of creativity? Now I have an expanding library of snippets from many projects and I'm going to take you through my most loved and most transformational liquid code snippets. In fact, the whole of the Spotify clone was built with no more than six snippets. So let's start with those. For me, personal or passion projects are all about exploring, pushing the boundaries way beyond what I get the freedom to explore in my day job. I've distilled the liquid learning from my entire Spotify clone project down to just six key code snippets. Six skills that I believe unlock the 80-20 of learning liquid. They open the door to endless new portal possibilities and I'm excited to be the person that unlocks this skill and opens up these possibilities for you. So you're not a coder? No problem, nor am I. All these liquid skills combined add up to around 30 lines of code in total. And one you'll see well, that's just a URL format, but a very powerful one. Okay, so let's have a quick run through our six liquid skills. So in at number one is the note URL. This is what we use to output multimedia or to provide download links. So the format you see on screen, underscore entity forward slash annotation, annotation being the logical name for the note entity, and then a GUID. So in this example, I'm getting that GUID for the note from my fetch XML. So here's an example of how that looks in the source code for my Songify portal. So in this example, it's been used to provide the cover artwork for Live Forever by Oasis. The source of the image is my portal URL and then this specific entity URL. Next is the entities object. This allows us to swap a GUID for an entire record. So if you're familiar with the URL format in portals, that tends to point to a specific template and then function mark ID equals and a specific GUID. So what does this line of code mean? Assign means create a variable, set a variable to this particular value. So I'm creating a variable called artist and in it I'm retrieving and storing a particular artist record. So I have the keyword of entities and then in square brackets the logical name for that entity and then I need to pass a GUID in this second set of square brackets so request.params.id is a way of saying get, saying get the ID parameter from the URL so if you're familiar with URLs in the portal that tends to be your portal URL forward slash the particular template forward slash question mark ID equals and a GUID so what we're saying here with request.params.id is get the GUID from the ID parameter in the URL. Okay, so we've retrieved a record with that single line of code. How do we do anything with that? How do we use it in if statements? How do we output it on screen, for example? Well, this will differ depending on the type of field. So for things like dates, single line of text, numbers is a simple matter of the name of our variable in this case artist dot and then the field name the logical name for that field in dataverse for other more complex field types like status reasons option sets and lookup fields there's just a little bit more to it so we need to specify in the case of status reasons and option sets whether it's a numeric value or the label we wish to output Generally, if we're using this in an if statement, we would use a value because that's unlikely to change over time. Whereas for customer facing aspects, so things we want to output as part of our template, as part of the visuals, we would use the label. Likewise, when it comes to lookup fields, so the example we show on screen there is the created by field. We need to determine whether it's the GUID we want to output or the name of that record. So again, most likely if you're using this in an if statement or using it to drive some other logic in your template, you would use the ID, the GUID. Whereas for customer facing aspects, 
we would use the name. So for example, with the artist, it would make more sense to show the user that the artist for this particular track is Oasis as opposed to whatever their GUID is. Next, get into the real powerhouses of Liquid, Fetch XML. We'll most commonly use this to retrieve multiple records. So maybe here are a list of all my likes, here are a list of all the artists, here are all my playlists that I've created, here are all the tracks that belong to that playlist. Here are all the artists album. So all of that just goes between these two tags, an opening fetch XML tag and an end fetch XML tag. We give the query a name, the reason being that much like when we set that variable, we need a way to access those records. So this retrieves them for us, but doesn't actually do any output. We'll see that in a separate slide. But in terms of how we actually generate that fetch XML, it's as simple as flexing your advanced find skills. So I think we all use that day to day within Dynamics in our model driven app. So we build our advanced find, then click download fetch XML and paste that within our fetch XML tags. So all the queries that you see on the portal, essentially on the Songify portal are done with fetch XML. The next liquid skill is very closely related. So we've done a fetch XML query. How do we actually access those results? How do we output anything on screen? So the for allows us to loop through each of those records and do something with them. So in this example, it's taking the tracks query and for every result that's found, it's outputting the name of the track, saying which artist that track is by, and then is outputting the note image, the cover artwork for that particular track. Next, here's a slightly more novel way to use Fetch XML, and this is to retrieve a single record. So you might be wondering why would we use Fetch XML to query a single record when we've got the Entities object? Well, the difference is with the Entities object, we have to know the GUID. We either have to have queried for it first, or we need to have it provided in the URL so that we can use that for the query. Whereas with using Fetch XML to retrieve a single record, we've got much more flexibility. So essentially anything that we do in advanced find, we'll just take it one step further and we'll apply a particular sort order. So for example, of all the tracks, I want to see them in descending order by when they were created, telling me which is the most recent track. So sort order is one very important aspect. And the other, as you can see highlighted there, is I've had to specify in the first line of that fetch XML, how many records I want returned. So I want the top one. Okay, but just remember top doesn't particularly mean anything. It just means the, the first result. So you have to specify with the sort order, what do you mean by top? Do you mean the most recent, the most popular, the highest value, the lowest cost? So remember the sort order is vital. And then our final skill of all our liquid skills is if. This allows us to do conditional work within the portal and I've used it for some graceful degradation in the Songify portal. So planning for the inevitable data gaps, these things happen. So what if, for example, a track has got no artwork or the audio for a particular track hasn't been uploaded or the track name is thousands of characters long and won't actually fit in our template. Or what if we've got the wrong mime type for the file attachment? What if we've accidentally uploaded an image as the audio track or an audio file as the image. Also a useful property to check against is size. Size will allow us to see how long is the text field or whether a fetch XML query actually returned any results. Maybe we'd want to see if the length of the array that holds our results is greater than zero before we actually output anything. So here's the makeup of an if statement within Liquid. The example on the left is checking whether the ID parameter in the URL is greater than zero. So we've seen request.params.id, but now we're taking the size, the actual length of that piece of text, that string, is it greater than zero? If so, what do we do if true? The example on the right just shows that we can extend this further. So as well as our primary criteria for the if, we can have as many branches as we like using else if, 
do please know it is E-L-S-I-F. That's not a typo, so it's not else if, as in two words, it's else if condensed into one. So we can have as many branches as we wish, each with separate criteria, and then we can also provide a default action else. So if none of the other criteria have been met, what do we do? I go through quite a lot of examples in the if deep dive on my blog, so feel free to scan that QR code, go check it out in detail. Here's an example of that graceful degradation in place on the Songify portal. So in the screenshot on the left, everything looks a mess. Where the tracks haven't had artwork uploaded, they haven't got any cover art in the note attachment, we get the horrible looking broken image tag. And another issue is that the alt text is so long that it's spilling over multiple lines. It's going over other rows within the table, making a real mess. So with just a little bit of extra work, in the example on the right, we've got a fallback position. So if artwork has been uploaded for that particular track, show the artwork. But if not, show a fallback image. Simple matter of an if statement, but makes for a much better user experience and it much cleaner user interface. And finally, let's bring together all our liquid skills. So first of all, I've got a fetch XML query to return a list of tracks. I don't want to make a mess on the page trying to output something if that is empty. So I'm checking first of all, are there any results? Is a list of tracks longer than zero? And then I'm using for our trusty looping action to go through each of those results. And for each in this example, it's outputting the name of the track, the artist, and then a thumbnail of the cover art, which we see there in the image tag. So lots of power, all within very few lines of code. We can achieve a lot with very little using Liquid. I hope you found the walkthrough useful and that it's given you a few ideas about new directions for your next portal project. The discovery that I found most transformational, believe it or not, was a URL to output notes. After all, it wouldn't be much of a Spotify clone without multimedia. That simple URL format unlocked all the multimedia capabilities. The audio, the cover art, the gallery pages, everything. But here's a little history on how that came about. That was born from a completely unrelated requirement on a separate portal project. I had a simple need on a property or a real estate website to provide a record specific download link to an auto generated PDF. I figured that out with the help of some Googling and figured, well, if that URL can link to a PDF, surely it can be used to link to an image. And then rather than link to an image, could I use it to set the source of an image tag and embed that in the page? Turns out the answer was yes. Then if I can set the source of an image this way, you've probably guessed where this is going. Could I use it to stream tracks in an audio player? Yes. Which brings me to my next point. My approach to squeezing every bit of usefulness out of every bit of code that I find. I don't just treat it as a one-off and conclude that it only applies to that one situation or use case. So here's my non-coders process to maximize what I learned from the code that I Google. Ask yourself, how else can I leverage this new skill? Try to see past this very specific application. What would a generic version of this look like? What's the pattern here? What would need to change to use it with a different entity or a different field type? Next, how might I use this in creative and novel ways? Where might this help from a troubleshooting perspective? What gaps have I failed to fix on other projects? Could this be the answer? Okay, so now we're convinced that Liquid is the key to making more flexible and powerful portals. Where does that liquid actually go? Well, there are various places we can make use of it. We can include that in web templates, web pages, content snippets, entity lists, entity forms, web forms, or web files. But to achieve the custom layouts that I've mentioned, these need to be within web templates. And we can access web templates through the portal management app. So I'm gonna switch from my Musify admin app. I'm gonna choose portal management and in the interest of time, just search for an existing web template. Here you can see we have an if statement that controls which template gets loaded depending on whether the visitor is an anonymous user or is a logged in Songify subscriber. These web templates are where we store the liquid and the HTML structure, but
but that itself isn't enough to actually surface it on the portal. For that, we need two more records, a page template and a web page. So I'll show you a quick example. Once we've created a web template, which is just our source code, which website we want that for. So if we're making use of multiple portals on the same Dynamics instance, a name for the web template. We can then go to related records and page templates. What we can do from there is choose an existing template. So there are various page templates that come out of the box, such as full page, or we can create our own page templates. In this example, I've repurposed the out of the box home page template. So now we've specified which page template to use. The final step is a web page. At a high level, here's what web page records do for us. The parent page field lets us specify where within the site this page belongs, which section does it belong to within the website sitemap. We can set a partial URL, which is similar to a permalink in WordPress. And we also have options to specify custom JavaScript specific to this page and custom CSS specific to this page over in the advanced tab. We can secure access to that page using access control rules. And also we have the option to set up internationalization, so translation for this particular page. But what happens behind the scenes is for every single web page you create, there will be at least two records. We have the root web page and then a localized version of that web page for every language that you have set up on your portal. So by default, I have the English language. I will at least have my root web page and the English language version of that. On that internationalized version, I've got a copy field. I've got a rich text editor and a HTML editor where I can provide some copy for that particular page in addition to whatever liquid is in there. Well, I'm afraid that's all we've got time for today. I seriously appreciate your time and it's been a pleasure to have you. As you probably guessed, I could happily talk portals all weekend. Now, if you'd like to connect, chat, collaborate, or just learn more about Liquid, check out my blog. I've got lots of tutorials on learning Liquid, code snippets, and finished web templates that you can download and learn from. Details and QR codes will show on the screen in just a moment. And be sure to check out Jim Novak's excellent session. It's packed full of value and a perfect place to pick up after my talk. Have an awesome weekend. Thank you. If you'd like to discuss this further, if you'd like to connect with me, you can do so on Twitter. I'm at CRM Biz Coach. If you'd like to connect on LinkedIn, I'm at Francesco Musso Dynamics 365. Probably much easier to scan the QR code than type all that out. And then finally, I've gone into quite a bit of detail in blog posts for all of the topics covered in today's talk. And you can find that at francomusso.com forward slash Scottish dash summit dash 2021. So thank you again for attending. Thanks for sticking with me this far. I hope you found that really helpful and you've all taken away something new. If you'd like to rewatch that session or you'd like to share it with anybody else, that will be uploaded to YouTube after 14 days. Feel free to spread the love on social and just use the hashtag Scottish Summit 2021 as you see there on the left hand side. Have an awesome day and I'll see you at the pub quiz.